This book is about change, and because change and loss are deeply connected, there cannot be change without loss. Loss haunts this book. A couple of years ago, just before Christmas, my four-year-old son was admitted to hospital. He developed an infection in the skin around his right eye. The doctors worried that the infection could travel into the optic nerve and then into his brain. He was given intravenous penicillin and monitored around the clock. On his first night back home, my son refused to take his antibiotics. My wife and I were alternately pleading, tearful and angry, all to no avail. Finally, I told him a story about the time I had to have my tonsils out and had run away from two nurses when they came to take me to the operating theatre. I just didn't want to go, I said. My son considered this and, after a few minutes, agreed to take his medicine. That night... I was startled awake by a dream, which began to dissolve as soon as I woke. I had an image of myself reaching out to catch a small grass-green lizard that had shot down a dark space between two rocks, vanishing into the earth. I thought the dream might have something to do with my son's illness, but what? Then I remembered another detail from the dream, the four letters S-I. D-A. I lay in the dark for a few moments, running after the dream, but failing to remember any more. Frustrated, I got out of bed and went to the living room at the top of the house. I sat there in the quiet, the hush interrupted only occasionally by an all-night bus changing gears on the hill around the corner. As a psychoanalyst, I feel uncomfortable when I can't remember a dream. It's irrational, of course, but failing to remember a dream makes me feel a bit embarrassed, a bit of a fraud. You can dish it out, but you can't take it, I thought to myself on more than one occasion. That night, I did what psychoanalysts tell their patients to do when trying to recapture the details of a dream. I let my mind free associate, allowing any thought I had to float to the surface, no matter how illogical or embarrassing. My first thought, a Spanish poem, was it by Pedro Salinas? I knew it wasn't exact, but I remembered, I forgot your name. The letters of your name move about now, unconnected, unknown to each other. Rearranged, they form advertisements on buses. They're on envelopes, shaping other names. You're somewhere now, but all in bits, dismantled, impossible. In a rush, I recognized the four letters. S-I-D-A is Spanish for AIDS, and also the very same letters rearranged, like the letters in the poem, moved about. I remembered a young man who had come to see me years ago for two consultations. He'd been referred by his family doctor because he was HIV positive and refusing treatment for pneumonia. Could I find some way of encouraging him to listen to his doctor or parents? During our first meeting, the young man told me that he was born and raised in Cornwall, in a small village at the tip of the Lizard, the southernmost point in Britain. We talked about his illness, but his lack of concern for himself disturbed me. I did my best to reach him. We discussed his fear of dying, and I suggested that his defense against this anxiety was to deny that he was ill and to refuse treatment. He left unconvinced of the need for help, but promised to return for a second meeting the next day. He was late for our appointment. When he arrived, he told me that he'd realized I was right, that he needed to look after himself. But instead of accepting treatment, he decided that the best thing to do was to take a break. He'd already booked a trip to Rio for Mardi Gras. Why not go earlier? The following autumn, I heard from his doctor that he had died, not from pneumonia, but from dysentery. Outside, another night bus went by. 
These two consultations, which did not seem that long ago, must have taken place at least 20 years earlier. The young man was only 26 years old when he died. His parents were probably still alive. I wish I could have somehow persuaded him to take his medicine, to come into hospital, to let his physicians treat him. But he was, like the lizard in my dream, out of reach. I did not know the words then, and I probably could not find the words now that would persuade him to stay. Looking up, I became aware of my reflection in the large, dark window. I again felt my helplessness of the previous evening, my momentary powerlessness at my son's refusal to take his medicine, and my fear that he too could disappear into the earth. Now, so many of the patients I saw when I was young are gone or dead. But sometimes, as when waking from a dream, I find myself reaching out to them, wanting to say one more thing. Anthony M. had been seeing me for three months when he went to get tested for HIV. Several days later, he sat on the couch and sobbed into his hands. At age 29, he had just been told that he was HIV positive. It was 1989, and there was no treatment for AIDS. His doctor in London wouldn't tell him how much longer he could expect to live, so he asked an old friend, a physician in San Francisco. With his immune system, his friend told him, he could expect to live for two years and hope to live four. Anthony felt isolated, frightened, and alone. During this time, Anthony continued to speak about his life and his feelings, but his flow of words became slower and slower, until one day he became altogether silent. Sometimes he would come in, speak with me about work or family, a relationship or a doctor's appointment, and then go quiet. On other days, he might lie down and be silent for the entire 50 minutes. I just feel so sad, he told me at the end of one such session. It is difficult for me to convey the feeling of these sessions, the overwhelming stillness and heaviness in the consulting room. There was nothing numbing about the silences. If anything, I listened more attentively. I sat forward on the edge of my chair. There are silences that are anxious, where the patient, arms folded, eyes open, refuses to speak. There are uncomfortable silences, following a disclosure of something intimate or sexual, say. Antony's silences were wholly different. He wasn't resisting or self-conscious. Under ordinary circumstances, I might ask a patient who has been silent for some time what they're thinking or feeling, and once or twice I did this with Antony. But I soon realized that my speaking was an intrusion, a disturbance. As I sat with him day after day, Antony's silences grew deeper and deeper. One day, lying very still, his breathing slow and regular, he fell into a deep sleep. The first time this happened, he woke up a little embarrassed. I think I'm just very tired, he said. How long was I asleep? But soon he was regularly sleeping ten or fifteen minutes in most sessions, and usually one full session once or twice a week. He told me that it didn't feel like sleep. It was more like passing out, being given a general anaesthetic. Three years into Antony's psychoanalysis, his immune system collapsed. His CD4 cell count hadn't been in the normal range for some time, but suddenly it dropped from 175 to 43. Although Antony looked well and was not ill, it was becoming more and more likely that he would soon contract pneumocystis pneumonia or some other potentially fatal infection. 
few days after hearing that Antony's CD4s were critically low, I received a letter inviting me abroad to a clinical seminar, and I decided to present Antony's case. During a coffee break, an eminent American psychoanalyst came up to me and said, A few of us were talking after your presentation, and I wanted to ask you, Why are you wasting your time on this patient? He's going to die. Why not help someone who's got a future? His question shocked and angered me. It felt cruel. It seemed clear to Antony and me that his analysis had helped him to overcome his anxiety and depression so that he was better able to make use of his physicians. Analysis also helped him to live with the unknown. In his words, live well while you can, die well when you have to. Still, the American analyst's question stayed in my mind and made me realize how protective I'd become of my patient. A few weeks later, Antony asked me whether I would continue to see him when he was eventually admitted to hospital. I told him that I would come each day for his session. We'd continue seeing each other as we were now, five times a week. What if the hospital won't let you? I don't think anyone can stop me coming to see you during visiting hours, pulling up a chair behind you, and us continuing to talk. Maybe they'd let us have a room. But if not, we could just draw the curtain around us, couldn't we? You want to know that I will be with you, as long as you need me, and I will. He replied that he knew I would be with him, and then he cried. Twenty-two years since we first met, Antony's viral load is undetectable, and his CD4 count is within the normal range. He's in good health. The right drugs came at the right time. We still meet, but less frequently. And though rare, there are still occasions when he'll fall asleep for a few minutes in a session. I now think that Antony's silences expressed different things at different times. Sorrow, a desire to be close to me but stay separate, and a wish to stop time. Antony has told me that he felt these silences were healing too, a chance for him to regress, to be looked after. The deepening quiet was a sign of Antony's deepening trust. It may be that his silences were also a way of rehearsing the moment of his death, but most of all, they were something we went through together. And in doing so, Antony found that he could more easily bear the idea of his death, accept the silence, because he felt himself alive in the mind of another.